Hello, everyone. Everybody, good evening. It's our second to last uh, Autism 200 class for the year. So welcome to everybody who's here, and welcome to everyone who's watching us at our uh, remote sites. So um, I'm going to introduce Lynn Vigo, who's therefore then going to introduce all of these um, amazing parents who are here uh, coming to, to share with us tonight. Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. We really appreciate it. So, um, but uh, Lynn Vigo here is a family therapist at Seattle Children's Autism Center, and she has over 30 years experience working in the field. Most of what she knows, however, is due to the fact that in, for the past 18 years, she has been mom to an imperfectly perfect daughter who is significantly affected by autism. Her passion is to help make life a little easier for parents through education, resources, support, and therapy, and I'd add, Lynn has one of the biggest hearts of any person I've ever met. So thank you, Lynn, and thank you guys, and hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you, Jim. Good evening and welcome. Um, our topic tonight is You're Not Alone, Preventing Family Isolation. So that, the first thing that I thought we would do is, first I want you to know this is not a lecture. This is a discussion. And we invited four parents to be here on our panel because there's a lot of collective wisdom among the four parents up here. And then you, as parents as well, have um, collective wisdom. But let me check on that. How many of you are parents of kids with autism? Okay, most of you. How many of you work with someone with autism? Okay, good, so we have a nice mix there. All right, all of you love someone with autism though, right? <laughs> yes, so do we. All right. Hello to our remote sites as well. So tonight our aims are to identify factors associated with family isolation. What is it about autism that makes families experience both emotional and physical isolation? to share stories of parents who have experienced isolation. So every parent here has experienced it in her own way and is going to offer some tips on how they dealt with it. And then also, probably most importantly, to remind us that we're stronger together than apart. Oftentimes, parents of kids with autism tend to be very individualist, very strong and independent people and have a very hard time asking for help. And so you have a unique challenge in reaching out and asking for help. And so that's what our panel here is going to do tonight. All right, I actually am going to let them introduce themselves to you. And so if each of you, starting over here with Jenny, would just tell us a little bit more about your family, who's in your family, the names and ages of your children with autism, and how long it's been since you got the diagnosis. Okay, um, I'm Jenny, and um, I'm married to my husband, Dwight, and uh, we have three kids, Amelia, who's eight, um, Alex, five, and Andy, who's three, and um, <clears throat> uh, at both Alex and Andy, my two boys, uh, were diagnosed with having autism, and uh, they were diagnosed, Alex, um, November of last year, and then Andy was a week later uh, of November last year. So it's been about 10 and a half months or so, almost a year. Almost a year. Okay. Kim. Right. I'm Kim, and um, I'm married to James, and we have three children together. Um, JD, who is 11, and Ian, who's four and a half, who is diagnosed with autism, and Abby, who's three and a half. And um, Ian was diagnosed formally in May of 2013, so just about a year and a half ago. Hi, I'm Catherine, and I'm married to my husband, DJ, who you don't see in that picture, and my, <laughs> I have three boys. Jake is 14, and... Uh, Joey is 13 in the middle, and he was uh, diagnosed with delays at 12 months and then diagnosed with autism right before his fourth birthday, so almost nine and a half years ago. And Daniel is um, 11. 
Hi, uh, my name is Joy. I am um, a single parent, and I have two daughters uh, who are together in the lower picture there. Margot is 13, um, Audrey is 16, she's the one impacted by autism, and she was three and a half when she was diagnosed, so it's been 13 years. Good. So I thought what we do is I will ask the question and have each of our panelists respond. And that, so if you have a question that you just feel you have to ask at that very moment, go ahead and do it. But if you can save it till we get to the end of the questions, you might find that it gets answered in another, in another question. And um, Jim's back there with microphones so that we can make sure that we hear your questions. All right, let's start with getting a diagnosis. Most parents describe getting an autism diagnosis as emotionally difficult. Was it emotionally difficult for you, and how so? You can go in any order you want. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, yes, it was very overwhelming for us. Um, I think it's interesting because for Alex, uh, he was four at the time, it was, it was relieving because uh, I had suspected something to be going on with him for quite some time, and uh, in seeing doctors and other talking to people, it was always, uh, I was always uh, told that I was being overprotective or just thinking too much about it. Um, and then with, and so when we finally got the, the diagnosis, it was like, thank you. I actually said that to, to the doctor. I was like, thank you, because I just finally felt validated um, with him. And then for Andy, it was a, it was a completely different um, experience, because uh, even though we suspected that there were some delays, um, the symptoms of what I thought were typical, you know, with, with what I was working with in my limited capacity um, didn't fit the mold for him. So um, when it was very apparent to the people we were seeing that um, he was actually, in fact, on the spectrum, it was quite a surprise. So that was very uh, emotional for us. Um, for us, it wasn't necessarily an emotional time. Um, we had suspected something was wrong with him from the beginning. I remember people saying, oh, wow, he's a really tough cookie to get to, and from the time he was an infant. Um, so for us, it was almost a relief because we had finally had an answer, and it was something that we had expected, and we felt like we could move forward knowing that that is truly what was going on with him. Um, so for us, us, it was almost more of a relief as well, um, just because we needed that in order to go forward with, with what he needed in his therapies. So, yeah. Thanks, yeah, so for Joey, we had known uh, that he was delayed from early on, and at, in years one through three, professionals would say, there's no way he has autism, and then right before he turned four, it's like, oh yeah, he has autism. So it was kind of an interesting, um, it was, Joey is an interesting case because he, he was so delayed in his development that the things he was doing didn't, he had to keep developing before he could develop traits that you could recognize as being part of the autism spectrum. So um, I, I can't say it was that surprising. I also can't say it was that I wasn't that happy or sad about it either way. I still, to this day, feel like there will be a diagnosis that's different, a, a, a different diagnosis that is a genetic, some genetic syndrome that just we don't know yet. So I, I kind of feel like we're still in the, in like a cluster of things rather than what the actual diagnosis will be. So, but it, for us, um, Joey, now, like as a 13 year old, he responds really well to behavioral therapy, whereas when he was one through eight, he, he couldn't even respond to behavioral therapy. Like, he would, he would just be absent from the world. So you couldn't, you couldn't do things that you could do with a lot of kids with autism. So anyway, the, the diagnosis has been sort of separate from how I interact with him. 
Wow. So, yeah, our diagnosis was 13 years ago, and I, um, as I was driving here, I thought, how did I feel when I got the diagnosis? I was having trouble remembering back. Um, and I, there was kind of a sense of relief because I knew um, Audrey had been diagnosed as deaf already when she was uh, almost two years old. So she had delays due to that. But it had become clear to me by the time she was three and a half that there was something more going on. And it was just really hard to tease that out from the hearing loss and the language delay that had happened because of that. So I guess there was kind of a sense of relief. But most of what I remember from that point on is just this sheer sort of drive to find out everything I could um, and get her started in every therapy that seemed like it might help. And always this sense that time was hanging over us. And um, you know, people would talk about the window that would close for her to acquire language. And I believed that back then. I don't believe it anymore. So at the time, that was the stress I was feeling. It almost felt like I had to go, go, go nonstop to like it was a matter of saving her life, giving her a life. Um, and that's what that period feels like to me looking back now is just me as like a freight train <laughs> plunging forward with stuff. So. Good. Second question. Some parents report having a hard time sharing the diagnosis with family and friends. Was this the case for you and why? <laughs> Um, okay, for us, um, it wasn't hard to share because I, you know, I felt that um, it explained a lot. However, um, what I found in sharing over over time was that um, people's reactions have been well-meaning, <laughs> but. Um, you know, I, I, I would get a little offended by some of the well-meaning comments that people would give. So um, as much as I want to share, I withhold because um, sometimes I feel worse after I do. So um, yeah. Was that with immediate family or with extended family? With both, so. yeah. We we actually, um, you know, we do have good support with our family. I think some of our family members, um, like extended family members, uh, may be suspected. Um, but even with that, we still get comments that um, that I, you know. I'm just gonna say well-meaning comments that are sometimes very hurtful. Enough said. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Danny. All right. Um, I, I would say that if we didn't have a hard time sharing the diagnosis with our family, but um, we had a hard time with their reaction because he, um, our son Ian, is what they consider high functioning, or he's, so he's, he's gained some verbal abilities, he's able to speak, and um, so a lot of them are now questioning the diagnosis, and um, several of our immediate family members have said that they don't feel that he's necessarily on the spectrum, um, and that's hard to hear, especially since we've been through all this with him and so much therapy, and we've put so much investment into it to hear them basically questioning what numerous doctors and psychiatrists have already told us. Um, I think that's the hardest part for us is um, just them not necessarily understanding that this is his diagnosis and we need to move forward from it um, and they need to accept it. So I think, I think that was the hardest part. We've kind of stopped telling people. I think that they just kind of understand it at this point as far as friends and extended family go. They know that he's different. They know that he, he's, he's just he is who he is and they take him that way. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree with what um, these moms have said. Uh, it, it's not hard necessarily to say what's happening, what your what has happened for you, but the responses you get sometimes feel less than supportive or um, hurtful in some way, and it's um, that kind of either a verbal response or an, or activities that change. They um, they make me more defensive or more, or t make me kind of close off myself a bit from a relationship that I had. So that's, 
I think that's the hard part. Yeah, I, um, I've never had trouble sharing what's going on or sharing her diagnosis with family or friends, but, um, but yes, I do find reactions um, can be difficult to handle sometimes. And I remember thinking, you know, if she had, um, if she were in a wheelchair for some reason, if she had a physical disability, people wouldn't be questioning, you know, whether I'm doing the right things to help her or probably they would. I don't know enough about those disabilities to say, but somehow it felt like um, a lot of people wanting to give their input a lot of time and well-meaning often, um, but about either therapies we may or may not have tried or their opinion that, well, she can't have autism because she smiles and hugs people or things that just kind of showed that, um, I guess made me feel more alone in the fact that I knew a lot more about what was going on and how to move forward. And I knew how much work it was to get to that point where I had that knowledge. And there just came a point where I realized nobody else is really gonna be up to speed in my family. They're supportive, um, they're helpful in the ways that they can be, um, but very lonely um, in dealing with the nitty gritty questions of what do we do today when she does this. And um, so it's been an interesting path that way. Question three, parents often say it's a real challenge to take their child out in public because those who don't recognize or understand autism can be critical of our children's behavior. Have you had experiences like this? Please share one or two or three with us. <laughs> <laughs> you can go for it. I, okay. <laughs> um, it's funny, I just thought of this one because she still does it. So. Um, one of the things that's happened to me with taking her in public, I mean, we've had the stories of she'll throw herself on the ground in the parking lot and I can't move her or she'll be, but I've really learned to block out the rest of the world with that. It doesn't, people's reactions don't bother me with that anymore. And in fact, I've had some really nice reactions sometimes with people who've come to talk to me after they've seen me dealing with a difficult behavioral moment, let's say, where they say, hey, I, um, I saw what you were doing there and, um, you know, you're doing a good job, or just something really, really nice from strangers um, has been good. But some of the stuff she does that I don't even notice anymore because it's just her, she, she likes to lick her hands. She especially likes to lick her hands when she's out at the park playing at the sandbox, or I don't know why, we've never figured out why she's not verbal enough to tell us. Um, and it drives people crazy. It'll drive people, I'll be sitting at the playground and all kinds of people come up and tell me, did you know your daughter's licking her hands? <laughs> I'll say, yes, I did know that. Um, and uh, so that's the kind of thing that um, I don't even know. It makes me laugh now, but uh, sometimes the six, I'll, I'll just know, I'll see her looking and think, I wonder which parent's gonna come over and ask me if I know that she's doing that. We were at a family picnic um, a few years ago, and this was my extended family. A lot of them didn't know Audrey that well. We see them maybe twice a year. Um, I took her to this because it was outdoors and I knew she could have a good time and I could probably keep an eye on her in a fenced in yard and stuff. And, and she did, um, but there came a point, they had a bird bath out there, and Audrey loves water, and there came a point where she just, out of the blue, plunged her face into the bird bath, <laughs> lifted her head up, flung her hair back. She was so happy, and everyone was so horrified about what she might have caught from the bird bath. <laughs> and it was one of those moments where I was rejoicing that she was happy and had found a good thing to do that really wasn't all that dangerous and wasn't gonna hurt anybody, and, um, but I just saw these horrified faces all around me. It was, <laughs> it was an interesting moment. <laughs> yeah, so um, I guess I'll just tell two, two ways in which um, it's been interesting to take Joey out in public. Uh, he loves to be outside. He just loves, love, he's like a little nature boy. He loves to be outside. And so we take him to the park. We live on Capitol Hill, and there's a nice big park there. And, um, I would just try to take him there when there weren't a lot of other people because he's very sensory and he would uh, kick the sand, right? And so he'll kick the sand in front of him and he's not paying attention to anybody else. And so he'll kick the sand into a cute little toddler's face and he'll kick the sand into, you know, anybody. And so um, I, I either have to be just right, you know, basically holding his hands, navigating him, or we just have to be somewhere where it's, where there aren't other people. And so um, I love being outside with him. I love him being outside. But I've had to make the adjustment and be creative in where we can go that is a place that's appropriate for him where he's not going to really get hurt and he's not going to hurt other people. He also loves strollers. So 
I'm always just like making sure that there isn't an actual baby in any stroller because he'll just start <laughs> pushing it, you know, and go, sort of shaking it back and forth. So strollers, umbrellas, bicycles, tricycles, shovels, rakes, you know, lots of things that he just will go after and a cane, oh, people with walking with a cane, you know, he'll grab. So I kind of just make sure we're not in a crowded area. Like going to a state fair would be horrible, right? Because you got all those things going on in a, with a lot of people. But going to the beach is wonderful and we live where it's like kind of cloudy a lot and there are not a lot of people at the beach. So it's like, it's great. It's actually perfect. Um, let's see. And then I used to take him he, get, he became really obsessed with elevators. I first started taking him on elevators, glass elevators, because of his eyesight. He couldn't do the vertical, where, where you like go up and f flip back. It's, it's, I can't remember what it's called. Is it nice? That's not nystagmus, but anyway, he, he couldn't do this eye movement. And so I would take him in elevators, glass elevators, where you naturally, if you're watching something, you're like looking up and then you your eye flips back down, right? So we do the, all these elevator rides. Well, over time, he became kind of obsessed with elevators. And so we'd go, and we'd go all around town, and we knew all the outdoor elevators. We knew the ones that were open 24 hours. We knew, like, all the, all the places you could go. Target at Northgate, you know, Amgen Bridge, lots of places. And so um, anyway, he started becoming more and more obsessed. And then eventually, I couldn't really take him on those anymore because he'd just get really upset. So it's kind of the thing where you think you're doing the right thing for the right reasons and over time it kind of shifts into something that isn't really right anymore. And it kind of, it's hard to know when that has, when you've gone beyond, you know, it's like, at the end when it's all terrible, you can tell it's all terrible, but <laughs> at the beginning it was all good. And so like that slip is really, it can be hard to figure out. It's a slippery slope sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the one story that keeps coming to my mind is um, I love Disneyland and it's always my dream to take my children to Disneyland as many times as I possibly can convince my husband. Um, and we, we flew to Disneyland right after his diagnosis. Um, so we had you know, the little official letter saying that he's autistic and, and he needs special considerations. And um, from the moment we stepped foot on the airplane, he screamed like he was, somebody was harming him. Um, he was crawling up the floors. I mean, it was, it was the most horrific experience of my entire life. And everybody around us was just staring at us like we were torturing him. And um, thank God for amazing stewardess because they let my husband stand in the bathroom with him the whole flight, pretty much. Um, to, to ease him. I just knew we were going to be like one of those news stories, like <laughs> plane landed because kid wouldn't calm down. Um, and then once we finally got to Disneyland, um, all he would do is scream no, because that was the only word he really could use. And so then everybody's staring at us, thinking we're torturing our child, because he's screaming no as we're taking him on all these rides. But really, he was super excited, and he didn't have a word for it. And so he's just <laughs> screaming no. And so that was, that was a hard trip. It was, it was hard for me, because it was such a dream, and, and, and I was so excited about it. And it's something that I love and enjoy. And um, it turned out to be pretty just hard <laughs> it was just it was just a hard thing to handle for everybody um, and then I mean just everyday trips to Target I mean I can't tell you how many times we've stood in the line at Target and he screamed and flopped on the floor and just yanked things off the shelves and I can't even hear what the guy's telling me and I'm just like just take my card I don't even care right now <laughs> I'm done um, it's just it's embarrassing um, one time I even had a checker asking my sister who she didn't realize she was my sister, but she was, she was ringing up behind me um, after the fact that I couldn't leave. He was laying on the floor, so I just took my stuff and my children to the side and we're standing there as he's laying on the floor screaming and she's like, is he okay? What, what is going on with him? And, and she's ask, he, she was asking my sister all these questions and then my sister got super defensive and, and you know, he's fine. He's you know, just having a sensory meltdown and you know, targets too much, just the lights. Um, in Target, Ikea, Costco, any of those fluorescent lights, um, those stores are all disasters for him. So, I mean, just even trying to go shopping with him um, is, is difficult. And, and I, being fairly new to the diagnosis and being a very sensitive person and caring what people think, um, I still am very emotional when people, and I get hurt feelings when people say stuff and, and look at us funny and, 
and I kind of feel like I have to explain it to everybody and I've, I'm coming to realize that that's just not possible to explain him to everybody. So um, I'm, I'm slowly learning to just shut it off, shut everybody off around me. I'm trying to do what he needs to do, just shut it all down and worry about him and nothing but him and keeping him safe. And yeah, so I could go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not in the training manual for target employees. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Sensory so. Sensory <laughs> overload. And yeah. yeah. How to handle a child with autism yeah. in aisle three. Yes. <laughs> we, we would be a good, uh, good volunteer for that. <laughs> Kim, have you gone back to Disneyland? No. <laughs> okay. We haven't flown again. We did Wings with Autism, and that was amazing. But we didn't actually take off. And he's since, since then, we, we've been trying to warm him up to airplanes. And um, we used to go on a cruise every other year with family. Um, and we've had to stop doing that because of this. And so we've, we've, we're trying to like really get him into airplanes and, and teach him about them and not be scared. And, and now it's turned into an obsession where every at least once a week, we're down at the airport watching airplanes. And he's got an entire suitcase of airplanes. So he sleeps with airplanes. It's a lot more expensive than elevators. It is. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's become an expensive obsession. <laughs> and then poke, pulling little airplanes out from underneath him at night. I, I don't know how he can sleep on a bed of airplanes that are they're metal die cast ones. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> yeah. Does everyone know what Wings for Autism is? Are you familiar with that? Okay, I see a lot of. Okay, it's well, amazing. Explain. Yeah. Uh, um, Jenny, her family took part in it too. Um, it's it's where you go and you check in, just like you're going to be on an, a regular flight. Um, you get your boarding passes. You go through TSA security. Um, they have you take the train over to the to the terminal or whatever, um, and then you have to wait, <laughs> just like you would on a regular flight. Um, so th thankfully, they served us amazing snacks. They had pirate's booty and water and all the things our kids love, um, snackies. And uh, then they let the kids go onto the airplane, and the pilot, um, who was very well educated on autism, um, gave the kids basically a tour of the cockpit and let them pretend to fly the plane. And I mean, it was, I mean, he really thought he was flying the plane, our son. He was pushing buttons and these alarms are going off and the pilot's <laughs> like, turn right, turn right, no, turn left. And it was, it was so amazing to just see the excitement and just the acceptance from everybody, the TSA, the Alaska Airlines, everybody who did it. And then they, we took like a 45 minute, I think it was, mm -hmm. just drive around the runway. Um, <laughs> that was a little bit brutal <laughs> um, because he really wanted to go up. He thought we were yeah. going to go up in the air. But um, anyway, so yeah, and then that was it. That, and then we got off and they served the kids chicken nuggets, happy meals, and <laughs> everybody was happy. Yeah, it was, it was a fantastic experience. Yes. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And Jen. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um. <laughs> sorry. Um, so I'm going to piggyback on Kim's. Um, what came up for me was uh, going to the store or grocery shop. We've completely changed the way that we shop in our household. Um, uh, I, I think I remember we moved here a couple of years ago and I took the kids to um, the store, to, to the grocery store. And um, simple list, but you know, and we kind of prepped the kids that we were going. And at that time, it was Alex. I think he was, um, maybe he just turned three. And um, it was just a nightmare. Um, total sensory overload with all the lights, everything going on. And it was something that, at the time, I wasn't really aware of sensory or what the terminology meant at that time. I just thought, oh no, what are we going to get? Um, and so he was rolling, um, I had Andy at the time on my back and then my daughter next to us walking and Aunt Alex was just on the, down the aisle, just rolling um, down the aisle and around, just rolling and um, I, I felt panicked. I didn't know what was going on and it just didn't help with the eyes and you, you can feel people's eyes on you just like you can tell if there was a supportive eye but you could really feel the unsupportive eyes like you you need to get a handle of your child so I think I don't even remember if I just left my cart and left the store which was pretty typical um, of something that we would do and I think over time I just stopped going to the grocery store, I would just wait 
for my husband to get home um, and then go and just accommodate that way. But, you know, two years later now, he's five, and of the three kids, he's the easiest one to go with now. So there's been, there's hope, I guess, <laughs> because I can take him in and he will know, you know, we'll have a list and we have a plan and, you know, um, I in actually can enjoy going with him to the store for a simple list, not the whole weekly list. Or, and, and that's been a good experience because I could not say two years ago, I, I would never even have thought like that was even possible, especially with that experience of him. Yeah, that one kind of broke me a little bit. Um, but now I can easily say he's, I, I don't dread it as much. I don't choose it all the time, but it, it is, <laughs> it's not something that I feel totally overwhelmed by. I just want to add one thing. Uh, my son is 13, and uh, I should have added that just this last weekend, I took him to the grocery store for the first time in about a year, and it was fantastic. He did great. And his what, what has changed in the last year is his life became much more simple. And so he does, I used to take him to, I had three kids in three schools, and he was in the car, and he was going here and there and everywhere, and we're doing the things he wants to do, and we're doing the things my other kids need to do. And his life is just much more simple now between being home and school. And, um, and so going out two or three times a week instead of like four or five times a day, I think his visual world, I think he, one of his strengths is um, like visual motor planning. So like if he's been in a grocery store, he knows where the elevators are. Like I can take him to it two years later, he knows where the elevators are. And so if, if I get an arm length from him, he'll, he's a total opportunist. And so <laughs> if, he'll be like fine for the whole trip, not complaining, not saying he wants to do anything. And then if I get far enough away from him, he's sprinting, you know, he's like <laughs> going for the elevator. And so his, like I said, his, his visual motor planning is really a, a strength of his. And so I think going to all these places in the town was actually very difficult for him. Even though he's good at it, it would be like having, for me, it would be like having a great lecturer who I wanted to hear standing next to me from sunup to sundown, you know? And eventually you're like, stop talking. You know, like, I can't take this in anymore. I, th I think that's how he feels about the world. And so having his world much more simple, I think has allowed him to then, when he does go to the store, he can. He stood there, he like ch chose his juice. I said, if you want it, put it in the cart. If you don't, put it back on the shelf. And so we went through the whole store that way. He stood, he loves the conveyor belt and he didn't, he didn't get overexcited. You know, he just liked it. He didn't, he didn't jump up and down and scream and get so happy that he was <laughs> out, sort of out of control, you know. So it was really, it was just so nice for me. He stood there. He didn't try to run anywhere. So that's, that's you know, way, 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 way better than anything five, one to five years ago. Challenges in the grocery store seem to be a very common experience because it's something you just have to do, right? Yeah. And it's not always easy to plan to go without your child. In the, one of the handouts that we gave to you, one of the resources that we offer is the autism blog. And my colleague Katrina Davis wrote a great blog on taking her son Arthur to the grocery store and all the steps that she took to reach a very similar place as Jenny. She retells a very um, funny and horrifying experience of him rolling watermelons down <laughs> the aisle <laughs> and uh, realizing that she needed to take some action to prepare him better for that or they would not be invited back <laughs> into the grocery store. So she has some great tips on how to start to prepare your child, visual schedules and other good things, short lists, that's one of the key things. All right, let's move on to question four. So the heart of the matter, all of these questions led up to this, and, and I think each parent has added something to the discussion about why do we tend to feel so isolated? What is it about our kids that, that leads us to that place? So tell us about your experiences of feeling isolated. What led to these feelings, and what did you do to deal with it? 
So be as specific as you can, because we want to offer some great tips. Hi, I'm Catherine, and I feel isolated, <laughs> so, but, um, <laughs> but not anymore. Uh, so, the yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously isolating. I mean, that you're doing things a certain way, and then you can't do things that way. So, you cut out things that you were doing, and you change who you're associating with some of the time, and so th so there's all these creative ways. I was like so excited to be creative and find new ways to do things and find new people that were going to be fantastic. And, um, and so that was all good. But what was not good was my disappointment. So I had a, sort of a huge amount of disappointment around my relationships with people and how they were unable to give me what I needed. They were unable to give my child what he needed. And so I had a lot of disappointment around that. And unfortunately, I often would let that disappointment in not getting a particular kind of support, I would, I would let that bleed into supporting me at all in any way. And so I kind of cut myself off from having some of the friendships I'd had or some of the family relationships that had felt supportive. I just kind of let the disappointment in my situation bleed into everything else. And uh, for me, personally, that was what was ultimately the most isolating. And um, in this journey, I've met so many wonderful people. I've met some really, I, my probably the, the main goddess in my life is my son's OT. We've, he's 13 and we've been seeing her since he was two. And she has shown me how to be completely joyful with a child doing things differently than you would expect to see a child doing. And so that learning from her, learn, just, I mean, she just cracks, she's constantly cracking up, she always loves him, she's just so emotive, and that, just seeing that, it teaches me how to, you know, how to enjoy him at that same level. So that's been, you know, having an ally like that is really, really, an ally and a mentor is really amazing. Um, and then, I guess, in the realm of disappointment, the second thing that um, I would say is especially in the younger years, I would see these, this bumper sticker. I don't know if you guys have seen this car bumper sticker. It says, um, you cannot simultaneous, simultaneously prepare for and prevent war. And I would see that, and I would just be enraged. I was like, that's what I'm doing. I'm like simultaneously trying to um, cure my son and accept my son. And I, it's, they're too far apart. Like, I can't, I can't be both. And uh, eventually, for my path was to realize that, um, that the way to help him was to understand him so uh, deeply and so specifically, and to understand development so well that my acceptance of him was understanding where he is and my sort of helping him, maybe not carrying him, but my supporting him was understanding that next tiny step in development. And so my acceptance and my helping were actually very, very close together. And so they weren't, um, you know, all good and all bad, right? They weren't really far apart. They were actually really right next to each other. So that, that's been my personal journey. And once I kind of found that, my heart really healed a lot and I had a lot less guilt and a lot less sadness, so. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> you said that um, one of the things that helped you was learning his heart to understand him deeply and to learn and learning about growth and development. Where did you go to learn that at such a deep level? Let me repeat that question to make sure everybody heard it. So the question was, Catherine had said that um, one of the first steps that she took was to better understand her son's heart and to learn more about development. And the question is, is where did you go to find, how did you figure out his heart? How did you better understand him and where did you go to learn more about development? Um, so the, the way I understood him better was to just spend all my time with him and really um, believe myself when I felt like we had a connection. In fact, this is uh, this is sound really weird, but one night I, I you know I was hearing all these different things. I'd go to 
nutritionists or naturopaths or you know I was going to all these different people and at one point this woman said to me oh I know this healer and all you need to do is give her your credit card number and I <laughs> I just about went ballistic right I was like okay and I even I just thought to myself if anyone's gonna heal him it's me and so I that night I went to him and I like put my hand on my heart and I put my hand on his arm and his, and when I did that it was like zing and I was like oh my gosh he's gonna heal me you know like that was like that was the thought I had so I know that's like woo woo out there but that but I was like I that that was my tipping point like like trying to be out trying to help him and hearing that was just that was the end for me so I decided I had wisdom I was gonna learn about my child I was gonna listen to myself when I saw what he was doing but beyond that I really needed I really needed experts and so my our, our OT was great um, we did hypotherapy with a woman who was great I went and saw a, a neurology person that was um, trained in Europe she was very different from anyone I'd seen here she was great and they, they all were different but had some kinds of insights so I just went to a lot of different people and some some clicked and some didn't, and I just tried to listen to the ones that that made sense to me. Does so everyone know what hippotherapy is? Oh, oh hip, yeah, hippotherapy is, is riding a horse. Yeah. So <laughs> he was riding a horse. When I told my son that his sister was going to be doing hippotherapy, he thought we she was going to be riding a hippo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah hippotherapy. I mean, Joey was a kid who was just totally inside himself. He wouldn't, fo he wouldn't even focus his eyes on anything. He wouldn't. Touch any, he wouldn't grab anything, he wouldn't focus his eyes. And so when he sat on a horse the first time, he sat up, he looked around, and he smiled, he engaged with people. It was like, it was like he had woken up by being on this horse. So we did that for many years, and by the, la the whole last year, we probably didn't need to do it. That was no longer his best time of the week. But I was willing to drive and pay and everything for the, when, when that was his best time of the week, I was, I was willing to do it for as long as. That was true. Then later, his OT became more, um, more where he was functioning at a higher level and, and more engaged and more aware of the world. So, we just kind of. Catherine, it also sounds like you, at some point, because you're talking about that, that struggle of wanting to help him, but also wanting to accept him, that you maybe shifted your focus from trying to fix him or see where his deficits were, and instead you saw more of what his skills were, and maybe more importantly, who he is? Well, exactly, and it's like, when you can see him do something, we're like, oh, let's, let's do that again, you know? I mean, like, if you're gonna grab that toy, like, I remember being in a, in a assessment, and they were, say, they said, oh, have him get this plastic toy out of this clear plastic box. And I was like, yeah, there's no way that's gonna happen. I mean, there's no way he wants to do that. And the tester said, well, that's part of the test. He's supposed to want to. And I was like, Drah. you know, like, my child doesn't have to want that stupid plastic toy. But it's true. He didn't, he didn't want to. He was completely inside himself. And now, now he would. He'd be like, how does that come out, you know? So um, why did I say that? <laughs> no. I can't remember I said that, but no. all right. Thank you. <laughs> remember the question? Uh, yes, because um, I have so definitely felt isolated for the first answer. You didn't ask if we did; you just said we did, right? Well, I'm assuming <laughs> Tell us your experience about being isolated. For the panel, because you have um, felt isolated, and um, and it's a pretty intense isolation. And I remember um, the the times when the times when it would hit the hardest is holidays. Um, not so much the big family holidays like Christmas, which was hard emotionally in other ways because Audrey showed no interest in any, not even presents. I mean, presents wrapped for her with her name on it. Couldn't care less for years. Now she'll sort of tear open the corner and see if it's food or Lego, and if it's not, she just tosses it away also. For it. Um, but that was, that's the result of you know 13 years of teaching her that presents are to be opened and get excited about, and that's what we've achieved so far. But the harder holidays were things like Halloween or the 4th of July, where you know normally you'd get together with neighborhood kids or with friends or um, you know and stay up late and watch the fireworks or go trick or treating and that is all stuff that um, that I wanted to do that I wanted to do for my other daughter and that Audrey um, and we tried for years I would try all kinds of different things go to a party 
before the 4th of July fireworks and try to bring all her videos so that we could keep her happy and awake watching the videos and bring all her favorite foods. And still, you know, at 9 o'clock, she'd be, like, ready for bed. And there was no stopping her. So we would all leave and go back to bed. And, um, and you know, somehow I'd get my younger daughter watching fireworks on the television and try to tell her that it was just as good <laughs> as, as being there. Um, so I found that those just kind of are good examples of the moments of, um, of isolation, but really it's because they're representative of the fact that we, um, we really had no um, social life, you know, with other families, with kids that felt normal and relaxed in any way. You know, we could get together, but I knew if I took Audrey with us to wherever we went, I was going to be 100% on her, um, you know, hands-on supervision all the time. Um, and that we were all kind of hostage to her moods. And if she was going to fall apart, there's really nothing to do except take her away. So um, that got progressively harder over the years. Um, and the other thing that was super isolating that I think I didn't realize at the time, but looking back, I can see it much more, was lack of sleep. Um, Audrey slept really badly, and she slept really badly in different ways in different phases of her life. Um, and, and so I got very little sleep. And I was parenting on my own and um, working um, and trying to support my younger daughter, too. And I, looking back, I can see that part of what was happening was I was just too tired to even think about other solutions for having a social life, because I was running on two or three hours of sleep a day. And, um, and that was just too hard. So um, finding solutions came in sort of the same, a similar process, I think, of re recognizing, um, recognizing the fact that we couldn't keep doing things this way because no, none of us was getting th anything out of going to you know, the first half hour of a party and then everybody having to leave. Um, but it, it's really hard to make that decision. For me, it was really hard to come to the realization that um, we weren't going to be that family, that we were not going to be a family that went and did things together, especially after putting in years of really hard effort to create this family together. Um, it was pretty devastating to come to the realization, but I did, that what we were going to have to do was break off. Um, one thing that made it easier was that by then, Audrey had started to have more interests of her own, um, not friendships or anything, but she uh, started adaptive swim lessons when she was four or five. Um, and has become a fairly good swimmer. She looks really sloppy, but she can get herself across the pool, and she loves it. Um, so that was an activity that I felt like if I could get someone to take her swimming, for example, then it felt OK for me to go and do something different that's fun with her sister. Um, it felt better than if I just left her at home with a caregiver. So part of the process was that, was like, Audrey enjoys this, and she doesn't enjoy what we're doing anyway. Um, and we're going to enjoy it a lot more if she's not there. <laughs> so. Um, little by little, and you know, some of the pieces that had to come in were um, finding the money to pay for somebody to help out. Um, Audrey was pretty much always too much to handle for most of my family members on their own, so um, that makes it a lot harder to make those choices and, and find ways to implement them. Um, but that's kind of the story of the, the solution to the isolation really has been finding ways to be apart and happy. And then when I'm with Audrey, or when we do a thing as a family, we're totally focused on her. And we know she's kind of, she, she, we try not to let her know she's in charge, but she pretty much is in charge of what the day's going to look like <laughs> because, because she has that power because of her behaviors. With, um, and, you know, and I enjoy her a lot more. And I think she enjoys us a lot more when we're not trying to force her to go do something she's not interested in. Um, yeah, we would never have tried Disneyland because I would have been on my own with the two kids in the airplane and I could never have contemplated that. Um, although I think once I got her there, she might like it. But, <laughs> but we will probably never know. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, getting people to come help out, that was the big, the big change and, and feeling okay about that. And I'll just tack on to that, um, learning not to listen to people who would ask, well, where's Audrey? In this sort of you know, sad voice. like we're, And sometimes I'd get kind of upset and think, you don't act like you're sad she's not here. You're relieved she's not here. <laughs> Anybody would be. <laughs> it's, it's so much easier for us all. But I had to learn to, because I was feeling my own guilt anyway about the process, I had to learn to um, block out those comments and understand that they were coming from a place I didn't have to worry about. So. 
Thank you, Joy. Mm -hmm. well, I'll chime in because I feel like um, I'm kind of in the thick of what you've just worked through. Um, Ian very much dictates where we go when we get there, when we go home. Um, it's, it's isolating because I feel like we're invited to less things now um, because I, I, don't, I don't know if it's because they, they know that we can't go or if they don't want the, just him and all he brings to things. Um, but it's, it's hard to realize that we've lost friendships and that family relationships have really struggled um, because of of his behavior and, and not being able to, to participate in, in events. Um, at, you said Halloween, she, she wouldn't participate in. And last year we had a bunch of people over for Halloween and we were gonna go trick or treating and two houses in, he's screaming, no, <laughs> he doesn't wanna go, he wants to go home. And, and he ended up going home and handing out the candy. But um, that's kinda how our whole family is right now. And it's, it's, it's hard because we're still, like I said, in the middle of it and trying to navigate and figure out where where we're going to end up. Um, but my husband ends up going one place with one kid or two kids, and then I end up going one place. We, we always divide and go in separate directions. And so it's, it's hard to enjoy holidays. It's hard to enjoy outings. It's hard to enjoy picnics or anything because we can't ever be together at these events. Um, and that's isolating on its own, just knowing that our core family can't even be together at these things that we should be able to enjoy together. So. We, a lot of times, end up staying home. We don't have too many friends over. We don't really get invited anywhere. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's isolating and it's hard and I hope to someday be where you are and, and, and navigate our way through it with Ian and, and figure out where our ending point will be. But, um, but right now, we're, we're definitely in the middle of the isolation. And, and our support group that, that I, Jenny and I go to together, um, I, I really don't know where I would be without it. That's been my biggest to just go and just vent and cry or just, just to even sit and, and realize that I am not alone in this struggle, that I'm not alone in, in this isolation, even though, you know, I mean, that's contradictory, but, um, you know, it's, it's just wonderful. I've, I've really had to push myself out of my box. Um, even though it's not working our family through the isolation, I'm having to work my way through it and I'm putting myself out there in ways that I never imagined I would. I'm, very private and shy person and I've gone to play dates with people that I have no idea who they are with autistic children and, and I met a friend at the wings with autism and we've exchanged numbers and, and communicated and um, I've I mean we're going to a birthday party this weekend. It's I'm pretty sure it's the first birthday party Ian's ever been invited to from from somebody from his social skills group. Um, it's just I'm putting myself out there in ways that I, I didn't expect that I would but that's how I'm finding some sort of relief for myself. Good, yeah. and, and that is really what it involves, yeah. is making an effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and even though I'm not always comfortable, I just go, <laughs> and I always have fun. It's always, it's always validating, it feels good. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, <laughs> Um. Okay, so experience of feeling isolated. So, I guess shortly after we were we got the diagnosis last year, um, you know I remember that reading about the t the window of time of you know your child will be whoever they are by age whatever, and just feeling that there was this race of just getting the boys in every single thing that was humanly possible and just filling our calendar <laughs> to the minute and driving time and everything and just going and going and yeah and that and you know we we were we're still pretty new to the area i mean it's been a couple of years now but um it was pretty isolating because i i remember feeling that um is this really going to define who i am and i don't want it to define who i am and is are my friends only going to be, my friends going to only be the therapists? And so having that, um, not that that's bad, <laughs> because I think a lot of that's great, but um, just having that question of like, what, what, what is my life looking like? I, this is not how I envisioned it to look. And um, 
is it going to be filled with therapy appointments for the rest of our lives? And, um, and just not knowing how, where that was gonna go. But um, you know, fast forward a year now, it's been a year and um, working through that, I think um, when I let that go a little bit of the fact that there wasn't a race and I started seeing the boys for who they were and what they are capable of right now and started working with what was in front of us, um, or when we started working with what was in front of us, it just painted a better picture of what we can look forward to you know, in the next few months as opposed to the next five years, which is what I thought where I, which is what I think I was doing when we first got the diagnosis. And um, alongside of that, you know, I, I kept doing things that I enjoyed doing, which was really, really hard. Um, because I think just as a parent or as a woman or whatever, it was, it was just easy to drop things off the calendar that belonged just to me, whether it was like coffee with a friend or hobbies I enjoyed. And to keep that on the calendar was really hard because I wanted to fill those things with therapy appointments. But I did, and I was glad that I did. And, and then also accepting help from people, like people that wanted to help, like that was really hard. I mean, I think that was just, it's just hard in general for me. Um, and going through that process was really life-changing, actually, to just accept help um, and ask for help. And then going to the support groups, which sometimes was really hard, too. It's like, I don't want to go. I don't want to add another thing for me. But um, that's helped, and you know, it's been a year. I, I went immediately after it was suggested. Um, you know, you might want to try this. And I think we got the diagnosis, and it was like three weeks later. Okay, I'm there, and um, and that's been good. Um, but now, um, I think I'm you know, I'm coming to that point of. I'm being more self-aware of what I need, like I'm putting that first, and, um, and I'm, I'm experiencing some of the um, effects of the things that I neglected for myself. Um, and that's okay, there's no race, like there's no race for me to get better. Um, it's just to put myself first, I think, was, is the, um, the key for me with the isolation is to just put that first and not fill it with stuff <laughs> for the boys. Okay. Last but not least, last question. And some of you touched on this already, and then we're gonna open it up for questions for the panel. What do you and your family do to have a social life and get out of the house? So either with your child or children with autism or without them, what do you do? Give us some ideas of things that you found are <coughs> easier, more accommodating? Well, for our family, um, we don't do very much together, but the things we would do together would be like go on a ferry boat ride. It's a great thing to do. Um, although they do have elevators. <laughs> <laughs> um, going to the beach, going to low tide, you know. There's, there's a lot of outdoor things biking um, but for me we have to uh, for my family for how our family works best I, I have to sort of make sure to do stuff with my 14 year old do stuff with my 13 year old do stuff with my 11 year old the 14 and 11 year old can do stuff together sometimes and they do want to they do want to do stuff with their affected brother um, they're very um, protective of him and they're very excited for him when he does something new and you know they're they're really sweet but they're they're also adolescent boys who have interests you know beyond 
uh, riding a tricycle. So, and then my husband and I need to do things on our own, and that's just super, super, super important because uh, my husband and I sort of approach the whole uh, our our middle son very differently, and so we really need to have time together when that isn't our focus, so that we can just remember that we like each other and that we need to be together. So I, for me, it's really been making sure all the individual connections are working and that we don't really do a lot as a whole family. My parents uh, just recently moved, but before that they had a big house, and so we could do the whole family thing there, and Joey could just kind of run around, and he, I don't know why he never broke it. I think he may be in... In eight years, he probably only broke one thing, one piece of glass there, which is amazing. Uh, but he, for some reason, he just was really um, happy to just run around there. So I, I kind of was not on high alert there, but that's sort of the only place I am that, that I'm not on high alert, so. All right. Um. Uh, our family, we, we are similar to you guys um, in that we, take time with each kid individually. Um, we, I, you know, my husband took my son, our 11 year old to a football game and I took him to a baseball game and um, then we take Ian to go do his things that he enjoys. So we do a lot of things just one on one with, with each kid individually because that's how we feel like we can connect best with each kid. Um, but as to, together as a family, it's definitely dictated by what Ian can do and what his threshold is. Um, so it's it's usually going for a ride, looking at airplanes, um, checking out police cars, and um, <laughs> we we try to go to the park, but he um, he he tends to run off. So that's that's still terrifying for for us um, to to do some of these outdoor activities. Um, we went to the beach for the first time as a vacation this summer. And it went so much better than we ever imagined it would. Um, after the Disneyland trip, we were completely, <laughs> we were all traumatized by it. So we we had never taken another vacation. So this summer we took four days and went down to Lincoln City. And um, he loves water, so that was another. It was it, we were really nervous going into this vacation, and um, he had to have somebody with him at all times because he just walked right into the ocean. Like, and it was so cold it burned but to him it was just he walked right out right right up to his his chin um, and he wouldn't have stopped if we weren't there so um, we, we do things together but we make sure we're well prepared so like the ocean we knew we brought my husband's family my sister-in-law we had tons of help um, we brought his sleeping medicine which has been a godsend um, <laughs> um, and so I, I think that we do a lot of activities apart, but when we do do our family's activities together, um, it's always very, very thought out, very Ian-directed. Um, yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. And as far as my husband and I, we have very little time together. Um, we usually watch the TV and fall asleep together. That's, <laughs> that's about the extent of it, so, <laughs> yeah. Either way, um, we do that. We do separate outings, which I've kind of talked about already. And um, and I've just found if I let Audrey let her know what we're going to do, I know the types of things she likes. And no matter how weird it might be, she's escalators, not elevators. So mm -hmm. we'll go to a mall with escalators, and she'll go up and down the escalators and um, knows where all the food places are <laughs> and leads me to those. You know, and if I just know we're going to spend an hour and a half doing that and it makes her happy, that makes me happy. And um, it, it, it has, some things have gotten easier with time, seeing the level she's developed to, accepting, it's not that I say she's not going to develop further, but kind of accepting that there's limits to what um, my frantic efforts are going to be able to achieve with her and just enjoying her moments with her. Um, but the other thing that I found for us as a family for social life has been just to have people over to our house um, because that's where I don't have to keep an eye on her every second and she can retire to her room and her bed and she actually likes to crawl under the fitted sheet if she's feeling overwhelmed and so she has that option um, if we're at our house. She uses that option at other people's houses too but not everybody is really happy about it. So, um, so I, we're all calmer if it's at home. Um, 
So that's what we've done a lot of, and I've had to learn to not try to entertain by cooking a three-course meal. Um, mm. I've learned, we introduced the family um, Sunday pizza night, I think six or seven years ago, because um, both the kids love pizza. I'm really sick of pizza now. I could be happy <laughs> never to see another slice of pizza, but I let the friends know that um, had stuck it out with us that long already that on Sundays, basically, we were going to order pizza, and if anybody who wanted to come by could come by. And usually we would have, you know, it's not that I have a huge circle of friends left, the people who really um, understood why I couldn't go do their other social things with them and were willing to come to us. That sort of weeded it down to a group of very close friends. Um, and they have been willing to do that, and it's, um, you know, and able to handle whatever Audrey's mood might be. She might have an evening where she shrieks the whole time. She might, the gentleman had to get used for, to for a while to her disrobing and moving through the house until I could move her back into her room. Um, you know, and she was a teenager by then, so it could be disconcerting. Um, but that was, that had the advantage of us feeling like we were kind of still socializing with other families. Um, and in a way, it kind of weeded down those families to the people that really, um, I now value a lot because they've seen they've seen a lot of this stuff with me, um, and they understand um, what I go through on a daily basis more than other people would. That I would try to kind of go to their homes and keep an eye on Audrey and get away as soon as she was falling apart. Um, so part of that has been me learning to share um, not just the diagnosis of autism, but really the nitty gritty, horrible things that that can mean, um, and. And the people who could handle that and stay friends with me afterwards, those are the ones, I mean, we have really great friendships now, much deeper than they might have been before. And I've learned to, I would never have been a person before who would call a friend because I needed a good cry. Um, and I do that now. I learned that through this. So, um, but yeah, pizza night <laughs> was, was a big piece of social life, so. Thanks, Joy. Mm -hmm. um, so we do a lot of separate, uh, Things. I mean, we do have some some regulars like the beach or outdoor stuff where um, we won't offend anybody and feel like we were having to explain. But we do feel pretty comfortable as a family going to the beach or to the parks in contained areas um, because um, it's we have more control over. Alex, or yeah, Alex now, but he, he would just bolt and we couldn't find him. Um, but I'm starting to see that with Andy, so we do have to limit our places, or we have a, we have a couple places. Um, but there is a lot of separate individual outings with um, particularly my daughter. Sometimes I feel like she's an only child in a sense because um, you know, we have to do that, and she'll wonder why, you know, we can't and whatnot. But it, it became our time, so that's an actually good spin on that part. Um, and then my husband and I, we, uh, we started doing a monthly date night about a year ago, which we've kept religiously, and that's been wonderful for us, because I think before that, we were lost. We, we kind of got lost in, like, where's our time? Um, or what's left because of, you know, putting, sleep has been such a big issue that that depleted us and we didn't have time for our, for each other. So we plan it and it's on the, you know, in the books every month, second Saturday, and it's just there. And even if um, we don't do anything and we just sit at home, I think one time we just came back and we're just like, we're just gonna sit here and we can do that. And that was good. And um, so um, we definitely keep that as a priority for us. Great. OK, let's open it up to questions. Yeah, can I say one last thing? Sure. Um, my, uh, so the last time we had all five of people in my family together was just like two weeks ago. And afterwards, I was feeling a little bit sad because I was thinking, this is so this is it, huh? This is the way it is. This was success. This is what success looks like. And I was still not quite, quite, you know, just like joyfully embracing it, right? And so I mentioned this to my 14-year-old because uh, he and I were alone. And he, he's like, Mom, you look sad. And I'm like, well, 
I, like in my head, I know this was a really successful outing and I'm not just feeling super joyful about it. I'm feeling a little sad about it. And he said um, something that really surprised me. He said, mom, our family is like a group project. He said, I've done so many group projects at school with kids I totally love, they're amazing. He says, every time that group project has turned out to be different than I thought it would. And I've had to be flexible, I've had to let go of my ideas and let the group project go the direction it was gonna go. And that's what we are. He says, we're a group project, everybody, everybody is part of the team, we're all equally important. And just because this isn't going the way you thought it would doesn't mean it's not the right thing. And that was so revealing to me because I think as a parent you feel like I'm in charge and I have to create this and I have to make this a certain way and um, I thought that viewpoint just was stunning. So well, I wanted to share good. that. Yeah. Very insightful. <laughs> Very insightful. Yeah. Questions? What do you want to ask our panelist or share your own experiences? <laughs> I'm, so I'm not a parent, I'm an educator. And I guess as an educator, what advice do you have for us on the best ways to support you when you are feeling isolated or have those feelings of, you know, desperation? Great question. Yeah, you know, the first thing we always need is sleep. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's simple, but that's, that's what really knocks you down, is not having any sleep. So. So what, what can educators do? I mean, is Come it babysit. <laughs> <laughs> you asked. <laughs> Perhaps recognizing that? Just recognizing that you're weary and... I think, um, yeah, definitely understanding that we're always probably way more tired than we look. <laughs> um, but one of the things I've appreciated in, um, in the teachers I've loved over the years is the teachers who recognize um, that I know a lot about my daughter um, and that um, the stories I tell and the advice I give about how to interact with her um, comes from a place of expertise and not um, of an overbearing parent situation. Because um, that's always been, I mean, the best relationships with teachers have been that kind of interaction where we interacted as equals around my daughter and not where I felt like I wasn't being listened to or um, my ideas were being, or, or my hopes for my daughter maybe were being, were excessive or um, too hard to put into place. Um, and even teachers that respected what they were hearing from me, they could maybe explain to me why they couldn't implement it. But if they took the time to explain that, it made a big difference. Yeah. So do you teach kids or, or adults? <laughs> oh, OK, sorry. Kids. Hmm. I've got to say, oh, oh no. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? that? The um, comment was um, really appreciating that teachers give credit to parents for knowing their child better than anyone and for not just seeing our kids in terms of their deficits, but their strengths. And um, even if our kids have a rough day, finding something positive to say about that day. We love the euphemisms you teachers use. <laughs> yeah. Timmy had a busy day. <laughs> yeah. We know what that means. 
Um, I was going to say my son's only in, uh, he's only four and a half, so he's at the early childhood center. And um, I mean, it's kind of a silly thing, but his school tries to really, they send home little letters or they send home um, little bookmarks with his picture on it saying, you know, mommy, I love it when you read to me or just like little things because those are, those are emotions and feelings and things that he can't convey to me and he, and he can't tell me, mom, I love it when we sit on the couch and we read together. So when they sent home a Curious George book with a bookmark with his picture, I mean, it brought me to tears. It was probably my most favorite Mother's Day gift I'd ever gotten. <laughs> um, so just even just those little things of validation that they that they do for me um, you know they sent the picture from the first day of school and this little poem about his first day of preschool and it just brings me to tears because those are things that he can't he can't say to me and I, I really deeply appreciate I think sharing the victories too I mean so I um, my daughter's third second third grade teacher um, called me one day, and I know teachers are busy, they don't have time to call all the time, but she called to say, Audrey knows her alphabet, and she's signing her alphabet, which I already knew Audrey knew her alphabet, and I'd been telling them <laughs> that, but I really, she called me with so much excitement, and we were both excited that Audrey had shown this knowledge in the classroom, and, um, and just the fact that she would pick up the phone and make that phone call, it was, it was huge made up for the fact that she, I felt that she hadn't believed me at first when I'd said my daughter knew her alphabet. <laughs> so. Let me ask you this, would any of you be offended if your child's teacher or therapist maybe took you aside and said, you know, I'm a little concerned about you, you seem sad, or you, you know, had some sense of that isolation and broached the subject with you and maybe suggested a support group or something? I think I would welcome it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's I, great because idea. I think sometimes that I mean I would be floored that a teacher would say I would I would welcome it because mm -hmm. somebody cared enough to notice rather than just think that everything was fine. Yeah, and point out that you can spend time helping yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the list of things to do for your child is so long that you can't get to all of it. So having someone point out, hey. You, you might need some help too. That that would be. I I would definitely welcome that. Most parents feel really good when our kids, teachers, therapists, providers notice us too and say, "And how are you doing?" Sometimes just that simple question can well it can open the floodgates. So people can. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, our remote sites, Alaska and Eastern Western Washington. Do you have any questions for us? Hi, thanks for sharing tonight. Um, I'm a sibling and so I can't really call my mom. It's like 11 o'clock on the East Coast and I just wanna say that you guys are doing great <laughs> and I just really appreciate all of your heartfelt stories and just the true struggles that you've conveyed. And just wanted to encourage you all that you're doing wonderful. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank Who's you. your siblings? Tell sweet. us a little about your sibling. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a younger sister who's on the autism spectrum. She's two years younger than me, so she's 22. Mm -hmm. And um, a brother who's 20, and he is on the autism spectrum, more on the spirit. So. Wow. I get the siblings, but I also um, just know that I really love my mom and dad for the strength that they have. So, wow, really appreciate them. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, the sibling perspective is a really different perspective. Yes. Siblings, I think those of us who have more than one kid can express that. You know, we parents love their kids unconditionally, but sibling love is, at least in my household, was not unconditional. <laughs> and, and I think for for even for our typically developing kids, it can be a, a love-hate relationship with their sibling with autism. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious if you can recommend any book or article or website that's helpful. question is, any <laughs> recommendations for books or websites or articles? 
I, I used so to many. read them all and I quit. Yes. So, <laughs> so many. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, there's a lot of blogs out there, yes. and uh, I think if you find a blog with a style of writing that speaks to you, I would just keep reading it. That, to me, that's what makes me feel less lonely. We do have included in your handouts there a resource directory that we at the Autism Center have put together, and many of the listings in there come from other parents. And there is a, a list on there for blogs, and we have one at the Autism Center, the Autism Blog, and it's written by parents and by providers, and we cover everything from research to support and events and things. Any other suggestions? I can't think of specific titles, but I will say, um, that um, reading other people's experiences, parent experiences, and support groups and um, has been really of more value than probably any of the mm -hmm. dissertations about. I've read some really good things to help me understand what goes on inside my daughter's head. Um, and um, from green, by green, experts or by parents? By experts also. Um, but most of what I've learned that's been really valuable has been reading from or hearing from other parents or talking to people who have autism who are able to express themselves more extensively than my daughter and I'll get insight then sometimes into why she does what she does or I think I get insight. I would hesitate to say I am ever sure I understand her at all. But no, I might make a quick, <laughs> make a quick uh, plug for our 200 <laughs> next month because we're actually going to have mm -hmm. a panel of individuals who have autism who are going to be coming and speaking about their own ex their experiences. So um, you know, if you're here and you like want in are interested in coming to that, that would be one month from uh, well, next in November. <laughs> Thursday, November so. Everything you always wanted to know about what goes on in your child's brain will be answered. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? First of all, thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories. Uh, this is really enlightening to hear what it is you have to say and how resonant it is with some of our family's experiences. Uh, the comment and question I have um, is about my son. I have two sons, one who's on the spectrum, and he's five, and then his brother, who's two and a half. And our son on the spectrum is really high functioning. Um, and he's extremely verbal. You know, he thinks out loud all day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a real, it's something that we're grateful for. Like we're really thankful for the fact that he communicates so well. And a lot of people who meet him, they don't, they would never guess that he's autistic. It would, it would take a while for them to get that until he melts down. Uh, which is not, I mean, depending on the, it seems that seems to sort of like wax and wane, like phases of the moon. So we haven't really felt isolated yet, but as he's getting older, all of a sudden like the social dynamics at school are a little more complicated. All the kids are becoming more aware of who they are and how Jay is different. I think he's starting to get that too. His brother is just starting to, I think, cue in on that. And so we're kind of like anticipating isolation coming. And have it's just like just now starting to settle in. And we don't really know how to, like how to, because he's like very conscious, I think, of the world around him, like how to explain to him what's going on. Is he aware he has autism? No, but he is becoming aware, I think, of the fact that like he's, he's leaving school a couple days a week to go to like developmental preschool. He's going to a therapist, and I think it's occurring to him like the other kids are not. Mm -hmm. and it's occurring to them that he's leaving. So they're like, Jay, why, where are you going? Mm -hmm. and what are you doing? Um, so I don't know if, like, if any of you have had experiences with children like this or where you're like, the kid, people don't get it until they do, <laughs> and then it's a problem. Uh, we're just kind of like, I think we're just on the threshold of, of isolation, and I really want to prevent it from happening. Thank you. 
Good question. I feel like you just described our son. <laughs> um, everything that you said I could completely relate to. Um, I, I think with us, and, and actually at the last support group I went to, I, I said, you know, I feel like Ian is, it's starting to become apparent that he's different. Where before he, he wasn't self-aware enough to know, and um, I, I don't know how to help him, um, and it, it hurts me to not know what to do for him. And, and, and even if I told him he was autistic or he was on the spectrum, he wouldn't understand that at this point. He's, that's, that's too much for him. But um, I think for me, what I had to do was put myself out there and go to support group every month at the Autism Center. Um, and, and I've started making friends. I've joined different Facebook groups um, for autism moms. And so not only am I putting myself out there, but my son as well. Um, we had a, a play date um, with the kids. And, and even though the kids didn't necessarily play together, they did a lot of parallel play at least. He was with other kids that weren't judging him and weren't aware that he was different because they were different too. And I think that has been the biggest thing to help me. Um, navigate this with him. I feel like we're, we're, we're walking this path together, but um, definitely support groups have been, been huge as well as, as trying to find other people in my, in my area. I also found out, um, I'm not sure where you live, but Kendering Center just opened a site in Bothell and they do support groups um, as well as the Autism Center. And then the, there's a couple schools in our district that I just recently found out have support groups and sib shops um, for siblings. So I feel like Sometimes you have to hunt for the information, but I think that there are resources out there to help to help with the isolation. And and the more you put yourself out there, then the less alone you're going to feel. Yeah. And I just one more thing I had to say. Um, my my fifth grader, the 11 year old, we he had an open house at his school right before school started, and I had to take all three kids with me by myself. And Ian, who only cares about airplanes, was talking and, oh, the airplane and, and this and that and the, the landing gear. And, and the teacher looks at him and she's like, well, what's your name? Oh, well, the landing gear and the this and the that. And, and he was thinking out loud. I mean, he was thinking about airplanes and that's all he could talk about. And, and at the end of it, she looks at me and, and I said, oh, um, you know, he's on the spectrum. And, and I felt like I needed to explain him. And she goes, oh, honey, I know. <laughs> and that was the first time that I, I was glad she understood. But at the same time, it kind of hurt. <laughs> like, it was the first time that somebody had that wasn't necessarily a professional in, in the spectrum, you know, on the spectrum, mm -hmm. realized that there was definitely a difference. <laughs> so, yeah. There's increased awareness of definitely. autism. And I think more people, which I think is great for all mm -hmm. kinds of reasons, including mm -hmm. being more accepting and understanding and welcoming of our kids and their yeah. differences. Anybody else have any? Jenny? So, um, so my son, my older son, is similar to what you explained about your son. And even now, we get, he's high functioning, and we get like, no, I don't get it, even from his teachers that know, or his past teachers. And um, so that's been kind of tough. And he's pretty social, so I think when, that, when they meet him, it's not so apparent, and you have to get to know him before you real, and spend some time with him until you really see where he falls on the spectrum. Um, but what we found um, that worked, which I was skeptical at first, was um, I think I can't think of the name of the book right now. I think it's this. My brother has autism, or mm -hmm. and anyway, my son's name is Alex, and the books, the way it's written, the boy's name is Alex, Alex as well. Yeah. But um, and it kind of explained. Oh, this is my name is Alex, and I think differently. And sometimes, and it was so perfect for him. And at first, we were reading it to him, and with my daughter and my other son and we'll read it to him and we didn't think that he was getting it you never really know i guess but actually just this week um because we're up front with him and we tell him okay you have autism you may learn things differently than somebody else and it's okay to be different and he came up with it himself he's like oh that's because i have autism and it was just like 
angels in the sky, <laughs> I think, because it was like, oh my gosh, he remembered what we said, and who knows how much of that you know, he got, but he's absorbing it. And that was enough for us. This, you know, that was a lot for us. And um, because we wanted him to be aware, we wanted him to know that it was okay because we did feel that like in the social setting with other kids that were older and he wasn't answering questions that were maybe that other children his age at the time were answering like what's your favorite color and he knew that it was a question but he didn't really understand what the question meant which and um and you know kids were mean and they were like he's dumb oh don't talk to that boy and you know, so it's something that we wanted him to feel confident about having and just that was part of him so that he could stand in that and feel confident with himself when it did come up because he is, he, it is something that we, I worry about. You know, he's not gonna get invited. He hasn't been invited, um, but he is social. So I think he's, He's trying to be friends with people, but not yet appropriately. So I, I would recommend books. And I know I'm shamelessly promoting our blog, but one <laughs> of the blogs that we did, and it's written by a parent who, her son at the time was six years old, and she was wrestling with how to tell him that he has autism. And so there's a blog on telling your child he or she has autism, and we also, I interviewed one of our psychologists, and she gives some really good tips on how to approach it because you can't say well you have this complex neurological <laughs> disorder and have impairment in these three domains they're not going to get that but as um, was pointed out here just pointing out how we're all different we all have something or another my son would always say that he had the little a and his sister had the big a she has autism and he has asthma and you know, some kids wear glasses, some kids have hearing aids, some kids have wheelchairs, you know, some of us are better at math, and just talking about those differences. So it's 8.30, any one last question or two before we wrap up? No, all right, I'm gonna skip ahead here because we covered all of this. Um, it's there for reference for you, um, you probably don't, need to hear this, but I'm going to say it again. Some of the effects of isolation are increased feelings of depression and anxiety, a sense of hopelessness, delays in progress. It affects the entire family, and everything just feels harder alone than it does with the support of others. So I want you to remember this. You're not alone, and that you really can't do this alone. I don't know a single parent of a child with autism who has the wherewithal to do this alone. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength because we are on this planet to help each other out. We're interdependent and we need each other. And there are people who want to help. You've got good educators up here. You've got siblings. You've got therapists. You've got lots of good people. Um, on, teachers, by the way, on behalf of um, all of the parents out there, Please forgive us when we're cranky. We don't sleep. <laughs> and it's really not personal. We love you dearly. Um, we're stronger together than we are alone. One small step. I think you heard each of the parents up here say how they took one small step. And it took a lot of courage to make that one small step. But when you do that, you begin to build on that success. You say, wait a second. All right, so I was able to handle that difficult situation, this is a different one, but I can do it. And it's not just the nuts and bolts of doing it, but it's that feeling, that feeling that you get in here that says, I can do this, I can handle this. So, small steps include these things. Tell a family member, a friend, your doctor, your child's doctor that you need help if you are feeling very isolated. Other parents get it, I mean we do. Not everybody gets it, but if you really want somebody who, who can relate to what it is you're experiencing, maybe not exactly, but in very much a similar way, find another parent. And peer mentors or support groups, as was pointed out, is a good place to meet other parents. There are internet groups, because many people don't live in a location where support groups are easily accessible in person, so 
There are lots of listservs and other parent groups on the internet. Educate yourself. The more you know about autism and are able to explain your child to other people, the less isolating it's going to feel. And if necessary, look for counseling and therapy for yourself. Listed some resources that are in your resource directory. So you can do this. Acknowledge the process, trust the process, believe in yourself and your child, draw on your past experiences, build on small successes. And if you need a mantra, is what I needed when it seemed bleak and I thought, I don't think I can do this. I reassured myself that no matter what the future held, good, bad, ugly, catastrophic, that we were going to be okay, that she was going to be okay, that I was going to be okay, and that our family was going to be okay. And there were many, many days when I didn't believe that, but I kept, <laughs> there's still days when I don't believe that. But that is my mantra, and I've been saying that for 18 years now, and that thought in my head has gotten me through some pretty early mornings and difficult nights. So with that, I want to thank our wonderful panel of parents for their courage and their wisdom and their willingness to share with us. And I thank all of you for joining us tonight and invite you to come back next month for another wonderful panel of um, people who are on the autism spectrum. That should be really enlightening. So take care of yourselves, ask for help, and uh, have fun. <laughs> Good night.